And so we have our input output differential equation. And also recall that the transfer function for the system is this. So we just learned this, so we don't have to recall very far. It's just earlier. Okay. The values of s for which the magnitude of this of this ratio goes to infinity are called the system poles. Okay? This is the definition. So the values of s for which the magnitude of the transfer function goes to infinity are called the poles. And the values of s for which the magnitude of the transfer function goes to zero are called the system zeros. Okay? Poles and zeros. And we're going to get to know these poles and zeros very well uh, over the coming weeks. We can rewrite the transfer function with, I'm going to use k to be bm over an, and rewrite it in this other way, which is in terms of the poles and zeros. So h of s is equal to k bm over an times s minus z1 s minus z2, and I'll tell you what the z's are in just a moment, times s minus zm divided by s minus p1 s minus p2 multiplying all the way up to s minus pn. Okay, so we have this ratio um, and the z's are the zeros and the p's are the poles. Okay, so if you plug in s equals z1, what is this first term? Zero, right? And that means the entire numerator is zero. And when you have a fraction where the entire numerator is zero and the denominator is non-zero, what is that equal to? Zero, so that must be a zero. And if you plug in s equals p1 or p2 or any of those things, one of these denominator terms is going to be zero, which means that it's going to be some, if it's a, if it's a non-zero number in the numerator, divided by a zero, then that gives you infinity, right? It approaches infinity. Undefined, approaching infinity. Now, so this is just rewriting it in terms of the zeros and the poles, OK? Since the poles and zeros define the transfer function within a constant, see right here, we, we did it. We could, we, could write, we could just tell you, here are all the zeros, here are all the poles. And that would define the transfer function. They also define the single input, single output system. You have to know what that constant is. But if you know that constant, then you know the system. It is now to, time to observe a crucial identity, OK? So a system's poles, so we just learned what the poles were. What are the poles? Where the magnitude of the operator goes to infinity. Yes, exactly. Which, if we think about that, at h of s is our transfer function. Remember how it's related to the output? The output is equal to h of s times the input, u of s, right? Complex amplitude wise, e to the st. So if h goes to infinity, what does the output do? It's also going to go to infinity. Um, so when your output's going to go to infinity ever, probably want to know when it's going to happen. And it's, it's, a, it's an important thing to be aware of. Okay? So, so that, that term going to infinity means that those poles are very key, very important. So poles are actually more important than zeros most of the time. Because um, when your system has nothing happen when you put in an input, Usually, that's not as bad as when it goes to infinity, meaning it goes crazy, unstable, or something. Um, I shouldn't say unstable. When it goes crazy, oh, on the app. Uh, it 
does, but I don't want to tell you about that yet because it'll distract you. Don't want to tell you yet, but but you're going to see it in just a moment. So the poles are equal to the roots of its characteristic equation. Characteristic equation. And also, just to make a little run on sentence here, and also equal to the systems. If you guys can guess this next word, I'll be really happy. Uh, no, not equal to zeros. <gasps> Eigenvalues, yes. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I'll do it. I'll b push the quiz back to tomorrow. You guys are impressing me so much. Thanks, Candace. Is it really open today? Uh, no, I'm gonna push it back to tomorrow because last year I had a lot of cheating on the quiz. In part, I think because there were it was open for too long and people could talk to each other too much. So I wanted to only be open for a window when you guys aren't all hanging out. It's ten minutes before midnight. The ten minutes before midnight. Don't do that. I need my eight hours, Mister. So the poles are equal to the roots of the characteristic equation. Which determine the homogeneous response of the system, right? Um, the initial condition response of the system. And also equal to the eigenvalues, which determine stability as well. So the poles are really important, and they're also equivalent to the eigenvalues. So I know we're, we're, we have had our time now, um, and we're going to revisit this in uh, a little bit on Friday, but the the key takeaway though is that we we know what the poles of the transfer function are when we know the eigenvalues from the A matrix. So these are all tightly coupled, tightly connected concepts that we should be aware of when we're dealing with these different representations of the system. Okay. These are really great questions to put on uh, exams, midterms, and finals, too, because they, they ask you guys about the connections among the ideas that we've talked about. So that map that I showed you, we're filling out a little bit more of that map, and I'll try to show you on Friday what we're filling out now. Okay. See you Friday, hopefully. Lecture, mid-lecture here, right? And now we're going to finish this one. Okay. Um, it's, it's really fun. I mean, remember what we were doing? Yeah. We were learning about poles and zeros. I should have just let Chase tell you what we were doing. It's kind of dark in here today, isn't it? I like it. Yeah, is it better? Okay. I guess the screens probably look better. So uh, what we were doing is we had just learned about transfer functions, right? And we use h of s, it's a function of s, uh, to describe or denote a transfer function. And we learned that we can write them from an input-output ordinary differential equation. That's what we did in the previous lecture. And that, that input-output differential equation um, is easy to identify what the transfer function is from by just saying, oh, these are my a's, these are my b's, and put the coefficients in, and the s raised to the power of the derivative. Right? So we learned that. We did an example. It was great fun. Then I said, okay, 
And oh, so side note, you can also go the other way, right? You can go from a transfer function to a differential equation by just doing exactly the reverse, right? So I showed it one way, but you can also go backwards, too. So you should be able to do it both ways. And then we learned about these two definitions here, system poles and system zeros, which are defined as the poles are the values of s. Remember, transfer functions are functions of s. The values of s for which the magnitude of the uh, transfer function goes to infinity. And then the zeros are the values of s for which the magnitude goes to zero, which is cool. And I, and I said, oh, we can actually rewrite the transfer function in terms of its poles and zeros, right? Also nice to be able to do. Um, of course, we don't know what, how they're related to the original differential equation. We would have to, what's the algebraic operation that you would have to do to go from, OK, deny. Somebody's trying to hack me. <laughs> uh, uh, how would you go from this representation of the transfer function to something like this. What's the algebraic operation? Factor. That's right, you have to factor it. Which may or may not be easy to do, but depending on how many terms you have. OK, so then I told you guys about this really crucial identity, that a system's poles are equal to the roots of its characteristic equation which are equal to the system's eigenvalues. So eigenvalues, poles, and roots of the characteristic equation, we will kind of use those terms interchangeably because they're all equal. OK? All right. Therefore, so now we're on the new stuff. Therefore, for systems with n distinct eigenvalues, or poles, the homogeneous solution is just y homogeneous of t equals the sum from i equals 1 to n of constants ci times e to the pi t. So these p's are the poles. The p's, the p's are the poles, yeah. Uh, the c's are just constants. Um, found by, how are we going to find these c's? When you have a homogeneous solution, and say you didn't have any inputs, so you wanted to know what the initial condition solution was. I heard it. Plug in the initial conditions. So that's how we find the C's. All right. So that is our homogeneous solution. So notice how closely connected all these things are. Solutions to the differential equations closely related to the poles, which are closely related to the eigenvalues. I mean, this is really um, a tightly interconnected web of concepts that we've been weaving, OK? And it's hard to keep it straight sometimes, but it's important to just keep coming back to things that you understand, things that are related to things that you understand, and how they're related to them. So poles. We just define them, but we're actually pretty familiar with them because we've been talking about eigenvalues. We've been talking about roots of the characteristic equation. So whatever holds true for those also holds true for these as well. OK, so now we're going to talk about a very common representation of a system. And actually, when we get to controls, this is one of the crucial concepts as far as how to represent graphically the system, okay, and the system response. 
So poles and zeros are either real. So for example, a pole could just be <coughs> some real number, sigma i, so pi. So th this pole, pi, could be equal to sigma i. Remember that we're using um, sigma plus j omega, that's sort of like the standard complex number to think about. Um, imaginary pairs, so it could be all real, or we could have imaginary pairs, so it could be plus or minus j omega i, so some, some imaginary number plus or minus some imaginary number. Or complex pairs, so you could have a real part plus or minus an imaginary part. So those are the three possibilities for our poles and for our zeros. We often plot these in the complex plane. And we're going to plot a bunch of just different possibilities. Okay, So let's plot first way out here. Um, what should we label this? Is it imaginary, real, complex? It's negative real, it's negative real right? So it's, it's a real, and then we also, um, it's a pole. We use x's to mark a pole and zeros to mark a zero. The zero one makes total sense. And the fact that we want to use x's and O's together also makes sense because we're all about love. Okay. Um, and also, L King, or is it Ellie King? L King. L King? Yeah, L King has that song, X's and O's. So you should definitely remember that song every time you think about a pull zero plot. Okay. L King. Uh, it's for zeros. So we're going to get there. We haven't, we haven't done a zero yet. Um, let's do a... Whoop. I like green in here. Uh, let's do a complex... Ooh. I already gave away the answer. What is this? Yeah, it's complex. Uh, I didn't line them up very well. It's a complex conjugate pair of what? <coughs> eigenvalues or, or actually poles is what we've been talking about in terms of, but it's equal to eigenvalues. So you're right. You're right. Uh, so complex conjugate pair of poles. All right, now let's do a, a zero. We can have a zero there. Um, what is that? That's imaginary, complex, real, because it's on the real axis, right? No imaginary component. Real zero. And we could also do a real pair of zeros, or sorry, a complex pair of zeros as well, like this. They should be aligned. That one was a little bit better. Um, so these are complex zeros. And we could also have, for instance, so these are just examples. This isn't an exhaustive list, but you could have this. And what is this pair? Imaginary pair of, of what? Poles. Imaginary poles. Um, and you know you could you can also be over here. So so far, if your system, so see if we can make this leap, right here. Okay. If your system has its poles in this left half plane, meaning that they have negative real parts of their poles, what does that mean about the stability of the system? It's stable. So 
and we know that because we've talked about stability in terms of eigenvalues and about stability in terms of the the uh, the roots of the characteristic equation, which we said are equal to the poles. Okay, so this means that you have a stable system if you're over here. What does it mean about if you have a pole pair on the imaginary axis? It's marginally stable. That's right. It will oscillate if you if you give it some initial condition, it will oscillate forever. Uh, you could also have, say, a complex conjugate pair of poles that are in the positive real plane. So what what is that? I mean, so what does that mean about stability? I guess. Unstable. Unstable. And since they're complex, it would oscillate, right? And it would damp out. Oh, sorry, it wouldn't damp out. It would increase, right? And if it was uh, uh, on the real axis, what would that response look like to an initial condition? It would just go exponentially to infinity, right? It wouldn't oscillate. It would just go to infinity. If it was a real or, uh, if it was a pole or a zero, it would do the same thing? So... We said that poles are the same as eigenvalues, but we didn't say that zeros were related to eigenvalues. And actually, zeros have no effect on stability. So you can have a zero over here, zero over here, doesn't matter in terms of stability, okay? And so I'm going to make that very explicit in this section. So system poles describe the stability. Inspecting the homogeneous solution, yh of t, we see that if the real part of all the system's poles are negative, the response will decay to zero. The following situations are possible. Left half plane here gives us what we call asymptotically stable. Asymptotically stable. Um, which means that all, well, that's not what it means, but this is what we call the situation that all of the real parts of the poles are less than zero, which means we're in the left half plane with all of the poles, okay? We have the situation of marginally stable, marginally stable, which means that all of the real parts of the poles are less than or equal to zero, okay? So on this axis or to the left of it. Um, obviously, you have to have at least one on the axis if you're going to have marginal stability. Otherwise, it would be asymptotically stable. And finally, the last case is unstable, which is at least one of the poles has a real part that's positive. Okay? But you only need one. So if you have one pole that has a real part that's positive, that means that the system overall has the property that it's unstable. All right, and we kind of knew that. That's why I was able to ask you guys up here before I even told you that <coughs> about stability, and we were able to make that, that uh, identification.